Hi, I'm Gina Wickwar, a 50-year member of International Wizard of Oz Club and author of The Hidden Prince of Oz and Toto of Oz. Today, I'm here to read part two of an Oz cliffhanger, which appeared in the 2001 and 2002 Ozianas. We're celebrating Ozianna's 50th anniversary, a wonderful book of Oz stories published once every year by the club. In part one of the cliffhangers, we left Trot, Cap'n Bill, Ding-a-ling, the crocodile, and Buku, the cuckoo clock, just as they were pushed off the top of a snow-capped red mountain. Now, let's see here what happened next. Part two, the red parasol Captain Bill was still holding immediately popped open and their rapid fall quickly became a gentle descent into the broad red valley that lay at the foot of the red mountain. Captain Bill concentrated on keeping a tight hold of the par parasol handle and within minutes, the four were tumbling into a field of soft red flowers. Poppy's captain observed Trot managing to sit up. We'd best make a run for it. She was remembering the dreadful consequences that had befallen Dorothy, Toto, and the Cowardly Lion when they had encountered a poppy field <clears throat> on Dorothy's first trip to Oz. Don't worry, child, replied the old man as Ding and Buku untangled themselves from each other. Ozma's enchanted the poppy fields of Oz to make sure they can't never again trap poor unsuspecting travelers. Oh, well, that's good, Trot replied. And when the two clocks asked what she meant, she briefly explained the history of the beautiful, though deadly flowers. After she finished, Dane declared himself starved, and the group looked around for something to eat. As if on cue, Buku's wooden bird appeared, issued a round of quarter-hour cuckoos, and then threw out a red cotton tomato, a glass egg, and three forks. With that, it screeched one more cuckoo before disappearing. Close allowed Captain Bill and beginning to enjoy the silly bird's unpredictable gifts, but not quite edible. Maybe, he said, pointing to a lone far farmhouse in the distance, we can bake supper there. This they all agreed was sensible. So after discarding their cold winter gear, the tomato, egg, and forks, they set out to reach the farmhouse before sunset. The red parasol, however, Captain Bill decided to keep just in case, he told his companions. Their purposeful trek across the poppy field, however, was soon halted by a large red fiberglass cow sitting amidst the flowers and crying as if her heart would break. From her horns dangled several forlorn poppies while her neck was encircled with a bedraggled Boston fern. A crumbled rose stuck out from behind her ear and several wilted lilies hung from her tail. Oh, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, she wailed. I want to go home. Oh, my dear bossy, said Captain Bill gently, handing her his hanky. Don't cry so. Tell us what's wrong. The cow took the hanky from Captain Bill and began sobbing even more loudly. Let me try, said Trot, stepping forward. Miss Bossy, she said softly, maybe we can help you get home. The cow looked up at that, her gentle bovine eyes wet with tears. Oh, could you, she asked them hopefully. Well, answered Captain Bill, we're a tad lost ourselves, but once we get back to the Emerald City, I'm sure Princess Ozma will send you home, or uh, just where is home anyhow? Oh, Torricelli's uh, flower bar, sorry. Torricelli's flower bazaar on 18th, between 5th and 6th, she answered. Do you know it? Can't say as I do, returned the old man, but it don't much sound like it's in Oz. Oz? Never heard of that burrow, the cow replied. No, it's in Manhattan. Just then she caught a glimpse of Ding and her eyes widened in fright. Oz must be on the Lower East Side because that's where alligators live in storm drains. Alligators, sputtered Ding. Can't you tell a crocodile from an alligator? Oh, are you a crocodile? asked the cow more calmly. Then please excuse me. No offense, I'm sure, growled Dean, but continued to sulk as Captain Bill pulled on his whiskers and said, sounds like you're from New York City. I am indeed, replied the cow with a little bow. My name's Flora Rosabunda, she added, spinning around to show herself off, and I'm a decorative cow, which was certainly true for Flora Rosabunda's fiberglass red hide was toll painted most art artistically with delicate pink and white roses. Miss Rosabunda, said Buku, returning her bow. 
Might you tell us how you got here? Oh, it was all very strange, the cow explained, frowning. I've been on the sidewalk outside Torcelli's for the last three years, looking very decorative and watching folks pass by. There's nothing better than people watching a Chelsea crowd, I assure you. Then this morning, a little Ari and her daddy came into the store, and he bought her a poppy, just like he does every week. But this time, Ari rubbed it against my nose, and it made me sneeze. Just one, choo, and there were roses and lilies and tulips and daisies and fern and ivy all over the place. The next thing I knew, I was here. She looked around her and moved softly, Ooh, except I'd like to know where here is. The land of the quadling, said Buku. Ari's poppy must have been a magical one. Captain Bill nodded. Sure looks like it. He said, so you want to go back home to New York City? Oh, yes, said Flora Rosabunda with passion. I miss the Torricellis and the Schuberts and the O'Briens and, well, everyone in the neighborhood. She sniffed and looked as if she might begin to cry again. Seeing this, Captain Bill patted her head. Like I said, come along with us and we'll ask Ozma to send you home. That's right, said Trot. Ozma's the queen of Oz and can do just about anything. She'll send you back to New York City in a jiffy. Flora Rosabunda nodded her head gratefully, and seeing her spirits had improved, Captain Bill quickly urged them ahead to the farm. Everyone, including the decorative cow, marched forward. After several more cuckooing sessions and a clamor of beings chimes on the half hour, they arrived at the tidy red farmhouse just after dark. The farmers, a quadling and his wife, were thrilled to put up with visitors to put up visitors from the Emerald City. They proudly showed off their apple and cherry orchards and their crops of red potatoes, red peppers, ch red chilies, red beets, and persimmon. All but Flora Rosabunda ate a hearty, happy supper of red potato pie, afterwards declaring themselves ready for bed. Their hosts insisted Ding and Buku sleep in the barn so as not to disturb everyone with their alarms and bells. Flora Rosabunda demanded to sleep in the barn too, even though Trot assured her she was a city cow and could stay with her. The animal could not be persuaded, however, and joined the farmer's two other cows in the old red barn. The three of them conversed in low tones until well past midnight, and what Flora Rosabunda learned from her new barnyard friends gave her a good deal to think about the rest of the night. After everybody but Flora Rosabunda had eaten a delicious breakfast of oatmeal, cream, apples, and cherries, the farmer's wife handed Trot a picnic lunch while her husband gave Captain Bill directions to the Emerald City. Make certain you stay due north when you go through the redwood forest, he cautioned. Otherwise, you might wind up in the forest of the fighting trees. Captain Bill thanked him, and Trot, remembering the tea towels and serving spoon in her pocket, presented them to the farmer's wife. Before the sun had been up very long, the five tra travelers were making their way northward to the capital. They had been traveling about an hour when Trot noticed that Flora Rosabunda's head was down and she was walking more and more slowly. The little girl dropped back to be near the cow. Are you hungry, she asked. No, I'm not made of meat, so I require neither food nor drink. Trot nodded understandably, understandingly. I have plenty of friends in the Emerald City just like you. They don't eat or drink neither. Then curious as to why the cow was upset, Trot asked, are you missing New York City terribly bad? I thought I was, replied the cow in a soft voice, but now I'm not so sure. Why? I talked to the farmer's cows last night when everyone else was asleep, said Flora Rosabunda. They told me I'm only alive and talking because I'm in the land of Oz. If I return to Manhattan, I'd be just another decorative cow again and not able to talk or walk or anything. She began to cry. But you could think thoughts in your head when you lived in New York City, Trot reminded her. Flora Rosabunda wiped wiped her eyes with a hoof. Yes, but I couldn't tell anyone about my thoughts. Here I can. She looked a little at, looked at the little girl imploringly. Do you think Ozma can make it so I can still able to talk when she sends me back to Manhattan? I don't think so, replied Trot, shaking her head. That kind of magic only works here in Oz, and that's because it's a fairyland. The cow thought this over, then asked, perhaps I could still walk. Again, the child shook her head. No, not even that. She said, walking and talking decorated cows only live in fairyland, Miss Rosabunda. That's just a fact. Flora Rosabunda sighed deeply, and Trot felt so sorry for her. 
uh oh, <laughs> so sorry for her. She dug in her pocket and extracted the red silk scarf Buku's bird had given her. Here she offered generously, trying it around Rosa Fl Floribunda's ample neck. The cow blushed prettily and soon began lowing a bovine waltz under her breath. Seeing she was happier, at least for the moment, Trot skipped ahead and joined Captain Bill, who was leading the band. They soon found themselves at the edge of the redwood forest the coddling farmer had told them about. Before long, the path became overgrown with wild red ferns. The dense overhead canopy of redwood branches blocked most of the sun's rays, but they continued north and did not stop until they encountered a signpost in the middle of the crossroads. One of its signs read, crossword puzzle below. Another one said WW ahead, while a third sign stated dismal swamp farther ahead. The fourth merely had a question mark on it. Ooh, said Flora Rosabunda, a crossword puzzle. Mrs. Torricelli always did the Sunday Times crossword puzzle in ink too, she added. Try my hand, tried my hand at a crossword puzzle once, said Captain Bill, darn near busted my brain. What's a crossword puzzle, asked Buku, and Captain Bill was just about to explain what it is when a decidedly nasty voice interrupted them. Fools, you're standing on me, and that's 12 across, five letters, rhymes with tools. Trot looked down to discover the source of the voice and saw a puzzle laid out on the path beneath them. It pictured a frizzled old man wearing a giant sash across his chest. The sash was squared off into neat rows and columns, each numbered across and down. Many of the squares were filled in with letters, just like an old-fashioned crossword puzzle. Ouch, the crossword puzzled man snarled. Can't you see you're standing on my nose? Sorry, said Dean, quickly jumping off. Puzzle on the path, he warned his comrades. Immediately, the others followed his example and stepped off to one side. There, that's more like it, said the puzzle man sulkily, then added, that's five down, nine letters. First letter is A in the middle, two letters are L and O. I'll be, whistled Buku in amazement, watching as the word apologize was spelled out at five down. A talking puzzle. That's 47 across, five letters, beginning with M and ending with C, replied the puzzle man, sniffing loudly, and the word magic appeared at 47 across. Do you make up crossword puzzles, he asked. You're certainly full of definitions. When Boku didn't respond, the puzzle man snarled. That's 23 across, nine letters, starts with W and ends with S. And I don't, and don't say I didn't warn you. Captain Bill leaned on his red parasol and frowned as he read the word wordsmith. But you ain't warned us, he complained. Fact is, you ain't told us a thing. The puzzle man snorted and said disagreeably, well, you haven't given me a definition worth writing home about. You've got to give me something interesting. Trot thought she detected a hint of desperation in his voice. But now Buku believed she understood. She leaned over the puzzle and said, the way to the Emerald City in a clear voice. That's 36 across, starts with Y, has 15 letters. Buku pointed down to the crossword puzzle on the path. Look, she chirped, it's spelling out Yellow Brick Road. And sure enough, they could make out Yellow Brick Road all run together, warming at 36 across. But we're in the Quadling country, said Captain Bill. So snarled the puzzle man, Yellow, Bricks ro Yellow Brick Road's all over this place. Trot offered the puzzle man another definition, the way to the Yellow Brick Road. 40 down, six letters, begins with D and ends with A-L. Trot scoured the crossword puzzle until she found 40 down and was just in time to see the word dismal appear. Well, the only dismal thing around here is farther ahead to the swamp, said Flora Rosabunda, and, D and Ding agreed, nodded in agreement. Is that what you mean, asked Trot, speaking to the puzzle man? But before he could answer, Buku's bird appeared, screeched a quarter, a loud quarter hour cuckoo, threw out an ax, and then dived back inside the clock. 36 across, two O's, five letters, growled the puzzle man, and Trot saw the word loony was appearing at 36 across. You're right, giggled the little girl, beginning to enjoy the game. But it was clear the puzzle man had had enough and was refusing to spell out one more crossword. I vote for the dismal swamp, said Ding, pointing toward it with his tail. Dismal it may be, but there's something pleasant sounding about it, nevertheless. Don't see as we have much of a choice, agreed Captain Bill, picking up the axe and much to Buku's regret, the travelers left the puzzle man behind to forge northward in the direction of the dismal swamp. 
I wonder what that other sign was pointing at, mused Trot as they walked along. It seems mighty peculiar having a sign with a question mark on it. That's just the way it is in Oz, replied the old sailor, it being a fairyland and all and everything magical, meaning nothing's quite what it seems. And it's Oz magic that lets me talk and walk, as Rosa Floroblinda, who'd been listening to this conversation with interest. Sure enough, replied Captain Bill, you don't find no walking, talking cows in New York City, do you now? The cow didn't answer, but looked more and more thoughtful as they continued their walk. By lunchtime, the trees were beginning to thin. I'm hungry, growled Ding. Seeing that everyone agreed, Trot spread out the contents of the picnic basket provided by the farmer's wife. And after eating, they resumed their walk and soon noticed that the trees, under which had been redwood, were now willows, their long, slender branches hanging gracefully to the ground. W.W. Church uh, chirped Hoopoo. It must stand for weeping willows. I adore weeping willies, willows, she added. They're so pretty. I've always wondered why they call them weepy, said Trot, looking about her with interest. Anybody feel raindrops, asked Captain Bill, clinging to the subject, changing the subject, before, but before his companions could answer him, they were hit with a downpour. Trot quickly <clears throat> ducked under one of the willows, but found to her dismay that she got even more drenched standing under it. Looking up, she saw it was a willow gushing like a broken rain gutter that was showering her with tears. Quick, Captain, she called to the old soldier, bring that there red parasol. Hurrying over, Captain Bill raised the parasol and he and, Tr and Trot and R Rosa Floribunda, who disliked rain, huddled under it for protection. I don't reckon this will end anytime soon, Captain, said Trot. We may just have to make a run for it. Right you are, Trot, he replied. So holding the parasol firmly over them, he counted to three, and he and Trot and the decorative cow dashed forward, closely followed by Ding and Boo Poo. The travelers sprinted for about half a mile before noticing that the rain had slowed to a drizzle within moments after they were beyond the weeping willows and the rain stopped altogether. That was quite a workout, puffed Captain Bill, stopping to take out his handkerchief and wipe his forehead. Now I know why they call him weeping, said Trial, Trot wisely, and her companions all laughed in amusement. The weeping willow forest had opened onto a broad meadow that ended in a marshy swampland, thick with cattails, bulrushes, and red swamp grass. The dismal swamp, said Ding happily, leading everyone forward. The first to sound the alarm was Flora Rosabunda. She stopped in her tracks, lifted her ear, and let out a terrified moo before exclaiming, you were wrong. It is the Lower East Side. You can't tell me it isn't. What she saw made Trot shudder and started Ding's chime and ringing. For in the bulrushes at the edge of the swamp was a whole family of red alligators, their eyes and nose, noses barely visible above the waterline. The father rose out of the water and sashayed onto shore, where he squatted, twitching his long tail slowly back and forth. Welcome, brother crocodile, he said in a gruff though friendly voice. And his five baby alligators called out an echoing, welcome. Clockadale, corrected Ding, grinning broadly and showing his teeth. Notice my eyes. Careful, Tor, called the mother alligator. Never smile at a crocodile. Don't worry, Allie, answered uh, Tor. He's a crocodile, not a croc. Captain Bill and the other travelers moved closer to see better. It was unfortunate that just at that moment, Boo Coo's cuckoo bird sprang out, cuckooed frantically, and tossed out a length of rope and a two layer chocolate cake. The noise sent Allie and Tor racing back into the water to protect their five babies, who began wailing hysterically and slapping the waters with their tail. Now you've done it, muttered Dean, casting a dark look at, dark look at Boo Coo, who looked sheepish. He moved carefully toward the alligators and called out. Don't mind Buku. She can't help quartering, uh, cuckooing the quarter hour and means no harm. She nearly frightened the little darlings to death, cried Allie indignant, indignantly and attempted to calm her babies. Closing one eye slowly, she added, but that cake might quiet them. Taking the hint, Captain Bill heaved the chocolate cake into the water and the five baby alligators fought gleefully for a piece of it. When they had demolished it, they looked up and smiled happily. Please, their mother said, what can we do for you, friends? The crocodile cleared his throat and explained their predicament. When he had finished, Tor closed his eyes for a minute before saying, the yellow brick road is not far from here, but the swamp is full of dead ends and you'll never find it without some help. Can you help us? asked Captain Bill. Tor replied with another question. Can you build a raft? 
I can, replied the old sailor, holding up the ax. The alligator nodded. We'll tie the rope to the raft and I'll take the other end in my teeth and lead you out of the swamp. Within an hour, Captain Bill had been fashioned a sturdy raft, lashing it together with bulrushes and cattails. While not very big, it would support them all, even Flora Rosabunda, who, though large, was light. At the last minute, however, Ding insisted upon swimming alongside Tor, and Buku demanded to ride on his back. Once the other travelers had boarded, the five little alligators helped Captain Bill push off. Waving goodbye with their tails, the babies sang this little sailing song in their high alligator voices. Sailing in the swamp is readily delicious, so all we want to say is our fun is very our fondest wish is this is you eat some lovely chocolate cake to swim in our dear papa's way to swim in our dear papa's way their voices faded and the travelers were left to an eerie silence every so often a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros would raise its head out of the water look curiously at the rafters then disappear underwater to resume grazing Several geese and ducks, mud turtles, and a few water snakes watched their passing. But aside from those, the travelers never met any other creature. Finally, Tor pulled them over to the bulrushes and let the raft drift into the shore. Here, the swamp grass and cattails had taken on a greenish cast, suggesting they were getting close to the capital. This is the end of the swamp, Tor said, dropping the rope from his teeth as Dean clambered up the banks and Captain Pill hel Bill helped trot and Flora Rosabunda disembark. The sailor leaned over and patted Tor's le leathery head. Thank you, he said gracefully. I always was scared of, of gators, but no more. You showed yourself a good friend. Tor grinned, showing dangerously large teeth. It's our tails <clears throat> and our teeth that scare most folks, he said. We're really not at all fierce, but don't let that get around too much. With that, he hurled himself into the water with a great splash and gliding gracefully between the bulrushes, disappeared quickly into the swamp. Trot watched him go sadly and Ding shed a genuine crocodile tear for his reptilian brother, announcing that hereafter he would no longer be offended when people confused him with an alligator. He was aroused from this pensive mood by his chimes, which started pealing loudly, and the appearance of Buku's bird, which trilled three horse cuckoos and threw out a pair of white gloves. Picking up the gloves, Captain Bill stuck them in his jacket pocket and lit his pipe. Turning around, he noticed a wooden sign pointing to the north, stated in neat green letters with the words, Emerald City straight ahead. And sure enough, at their feet lay the yellow brick road, just as the puzzle man had said. Oh, Captain, said Trot, stepping happily onto the yellow pavement. We're almost home. That we are, child, agreed the old man. And with a lighter step, they all marched forward, hoping to reach the capital before dinner time. Soon the green spires of Ozma's palace could be seen in the distance, and Flora Rosabunda, who had been quite gay and spirited after her raft ride, began to hold back. Bit by bit, she slowed her pace until finally she stopped altogether and hung her head. Trot stopped next to her. Now what's the matter? Laura Rosabunda had trouble choking back her tears. Do you think Ozma would let me stay in the land of Oz? She sniffed. Stay, but I thought you wanted to go home, said Trot. I did, replied Flora Rosabunda, drying her eyes, but I've changed my mind. I like walking and talking and being able to have adventures. As much as I'd miss the Torricellis, the Schuberts, and the O'Briens, I'd miss Oz, and you know, even more. Ozma can't be expected to open the land of Oz to every um, cow who needs a home, Trot began. But seeing Flora Rosabunda was on the brink of tears once again, she added hastily, but I'll ask her. That would be just wonderful, replied the cow grace gratefully. Just then, the sound of a cheerful whistling drifted toward them, and from around the bend, they watched as two figures approached. One, a wobbly, straw-stuffed man dressed in blue farmer's overalls, and the other, a young woman in green. Todd's eyes brightened and Captain Bill perked up as well. Give it ain't our old friend, the scarecrow and jelly a jam, he said with a smile and hurried forward to greet them. What on earth are you two doing here? Asked Trot breathlessly, taking Jellia's hands in her own. Well, we've been to Ginger's for a touch-up of the Scarecrow's face, explained Jellia, nodding in the direction of her friend. But what about you? The last time I saw you, you were setting out for a row on the Winky River. She paused and stared unabashedly at Flora Rosabunda, Dean, and Boo-Boo. Who are they and how did you get here? 
Before Trot could reply, Buku's bird sprang out, emitted a shrill chorus of cuckoos, snatched the gloves off the scarecrow's jaw hands, threw out a small brass horn, and dived back into the into the clock. Whoa there, shouted <clears throat> the scarecrow, trying in vain to grab his gloves back. But Captain Bill just laughed. I think the bird's trying to tell you something, he said, pocketing the horn and taking out the pair of gloves the cuckoo had thrown out earlier. He's right, Scarecrow smiled Jellia as Captain Bill handed her the gloves and she fitted them over the Scarecrow's flimsy fingers. Your old gloves were worn and covered with paint. With these and your new paint job, you look brand new. The Scarecrow held out his hands and looked at the gloves critically. I believe you're right, he said, nodding in agreement. The sun was setting as they passed through the gates of the Emerald City. Trot had just finished telling Jellia Jam and the Scarecrow all about her and Captain Bill's adventures and their new friends. They were climbing the steps of Ozma's palace when they were nearly knocked over by the soldier with the, with the green whiskers, who was dashing down the stairs, his long green beard flowing wildly behind him. Stop a minute, friend, said the Scarecrow, catching him by the soldier shoulders and nearly spinning him around. What's the matter? The matter, wailed the soldier with the green whiskers. The matter? Someone's misplaced Ozma's dinner bell, and that's what's the matter. And now we'll all be late for dinner, and Ozma will be upset. And well, it just doesn't bear thinking about. He rolled his eyes and wrung his hands and was on the verge of weeping. Seeing his great distress, Captain Bill removed the cuckoo bird's brass horn from his jacket pocket and handed it to the fellow. The soldier with the green whiskers grabbed it gratefully, blew it loudly, and everyone in Ozma's court, including the newcomers, marched into the banquet room. The little queen herself stood in the doorway, greeting her guests as they entered. Please introduce your new friends, Captain, said Ozma, sing, upon singing Ding, Buku, and Floribunda, who were following somewhat nervously behind the old sailor. Of course, he replied, quickly presenting the crocodile, the cuckoo clock, and Flora Rosabunda to the princess. Next, Ozma insisted that Trot relate their adventures of the last two days, which the little troll did, beginning with the royal rowboat and the whirlpool and ending with their raft ride in the swamp. But I didn't even know you'd taken a trip, said the little queen. Neither did we, chorus the wizard and Dorothy and all the others in the banquet, banquet room confirmed they had not known either. The only person who did was me, said Jellia Jam, and I left with the scarecrow just to visit Ginger. Which reminds me, scarecrow, said Ozma, your new smile is simply wonderful. The scarecrow beamed, yes, he admitted modestly, Ginger does a splendid job and this particular touch up is especially friendly. Feeling more and more left out, Flora Rosabunda was trying to hide her rather large red girth behind a green velvet curtain, but without much success. Seeing this, Trot went over to Ozma and whispered in her ear. The ruler of Oz nodded and approached the cow. Miss Flora, she said gently, Trot tells me you'd be miserable if I sent you home to Manhattan. Is that true? I didn't think so at first, admitted Flora Rosabunda, but after meeting Trot and Captain Bill and Ding and Buku and everyone, I know I would be, especially if I couldn't walk or talk. Her lower lip quivered. Then please consider yourself a citizen of Oz, said Ozma with a smile. I think we can use a decorative cow in this palace. She next turned to Ding and Buku, who had been watching all this without uttering one single chime or cuckoo. And a castle can always use more clocks. Would you two like to stay here? Not knowing what to say, Ding's eyes began to spin out of control, which set off his bell chimes prematurely. Hearing this, Buku's bird leaped out and, much to Trot's surprise, sang a chorus of in tune cuckoos before blowing a kiss to Ozma and disappearing again. I think, laughed the little girl, that's a yes on both counts. Three letters begins with Y, ends in ES, chirped Buku, and everyone cheered the newcomers as they sat down to dinner. The end.